whenever you're ready. Okay, great. So I actually don't know if I saw Katie on or not, but uh, two weeks ago, she did a wonderful presentation on the OCD bubble and introduced the exercise of holding off on rituals and compulsions after identifying that crossover point. And I sort of see this reality sensing chapter, it builds on that um, to help the client further reduce the pull towards um, uh, towards the bubble, towards the story, towards those compulsions. So this is a picture, I hope you can see it okay, of a very popular spot in Brazil where thrill seekers will go to um, take these wonderful Instagram photos. But this is the reality of that cliff, three <laughs> feet off the ground. Yeah, so this is just my <laughs> pictorial of how reality sensing helps us to understand and identify sort of the unreality of the obsession. Okay, so up to now, what we've been learning are the cognitive processes OCD is using to keep clients stuck, right? Or engaged in the story. And we've learned that there are these falsehoods of OCD that, happen and, and get us stuck in that inferential confusion, right? So what are these falsehoods? So we've learned that the obsessions occur without any direct link to reality, right? So they originate 100% from the imagination. Um, we also are learning or have learned up to this point that they are not valid possibilities, that OCD is 100% irrelevant, right? There is no evidence in the here and now that, um, that the obsession is real. Then we've gotten to the point where we are working with the client to identify the crossover point, right? And the crossover point is when the client is leaving the reality and going into the imagination, <laughs> right? So this is where we're really helping and leading the client to understand that the obsession um, therefore go completely against reality, right? And so with these um, falsehoods of obsessions, we are now at the point where reality sensing is helping to bring us back to the here and now. So, uncertainty ahead, right? And this is going to lead into this discussion later um, uh, when Kimberly comes in. But what what we what we have learned is that the doubt is what is creating the uncertainty. Right? And that certainty exists prior to the doubt. So, you know, right now I can have certainty that my car is parked safely in my driveway. I can have certainty that my, um, I turned the shower off when I got out of the shower. I can have certainty that I am in a loving relationship with my spouse. I can have certainty that I am not going to kill my kids today. Right, so I have that certainty, but then the doubt occurs. What if somebody stole my car? What if I'm flooding my sister's bathroom? What if, um, what if my husband just decides to leave me? What if, um, what if I go crazy and harm my children, right? So then that's where the uncertainty happens and we can get back to certainty. We can regain um, certainty through reality sensing. And so this, I think, is um, one of those concepts that can be quite difficult for those of us who were trained in what I guess I will call traditional ERP or for clients that have gone through ERP, right? It's, it's, this is a concept that's quite different than what we have been exposed to before. Um, I think one of the reasons why this can be difficult is because ICBT, and please correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> this is one of my takeaways, but ICBT is focused on the here and now. It's not focused on future possibilities, but that's true of all of us 
um, inside or outside of OCD. We never know what the future holds, but in the, in the right here, the right now, I have that ability to get to certainty. Questions, comments, or um, adjustments? Okay. Okay, so I pulled this um, off of the website. Fred had um, posted this a while back and I really like this, um, this graphic to show clients that we've got our perception and we've got our imagination. And when we're in sort of just normal um, thinking, we have a little bit of an overlap between those two because we're creative. Humans are just creative, right? But when we're in our perception, we have our five senses and they are detecting real probabilities, right? And then we can change those real probabilities by modifying our reality, okay? So I look outside, I wanted to go for a hike after this call, it's pouring down rain, right? So my five senses are detecting that that's going to be problematic for me if I don't want to get wet. So I'm going to have to adjust my reality. Either I'm going to wait or I'm going to dress differently, but I can change that reality because, or I can change my uh, probabilities because I'm looking at reality, right? And then we have our imagination, right? And we imagination creates possibilities and change the imaginary possibilities by modifying scenarios in the imagination. So I think of this as like um, those wonderful exercises Teresa's talked about, Carl's talked about, where we practice with the client going into an imaginary scenario, right? Like flying or floating or being stranded on that desert island with your celebrity crush. I like to use the one of you just won $5 million. So we work with our clients to really create a lot of different possibilities within this imaginary scenario, but they're very easily led back to the reality. When we're in obsession, those two are more tightly fused, right? So we have the imaginary possibilities are being treated as real probabilities. And therefore we're trying to change imaginary possibilities by modifying our reality, right? So we are conducting compulsions in an effort to change these imaginary probabilities. So we want to get clients back to um, reality sensing so they can identify the difference between that. Um, these are some pitfalls that are outlined within the chapter where people can get stuck with their reality sensing. Mm -hmm. So trust what the senses do not say. Okay, so what, what does this mean? OCD tricks the client into believing that their senses are not doing their job. Right. I can't trust my senses because they're asleep on the duty. Right. Like they just my sight didn't tell me that I didn't. I saw that correctly. Right. So I'm currently not hearing water running so I can trust my senses that I'm not flooding that bathroom right now. Right. I I'm sitting right by um, by a window where I can see my driveway. Right. I didn't see my car drive away. So I can trust that nobody stole my car, right? So I'm using my senses appropriately, not assuming that I just didn't see it or I'm just not hearing it correctly. Then we've got doubt, distrust versus reality sensing. And this is where OCD cons the client into staying in the imagination where doubt is king, right? Because anything can happen within the imagination. So, at this point, we are really encouraging clients to act on the knowledge that they have learned from the falsehoods of OCD that you know, have been reinforced over the, over the previous modules that they do not need to engage in compulsions because the obsession is false, right? So we're, we're really encouraging the client to disengage with the need to do the compulsion. Okay, and then we've got, um, I don't know if anybody can even see what that says. I'm not sure I can remember what it says. Um, when reality gets in the way, right? And so when reality gets in the way, we are disconfirming what we um, are um, 
actually experiencing and we're staying in the imagination, right? So it is that OCD has tricked us to believe that the reality is what is irrelevant. And so we need to sometimes create that alternative story. So when we're creating an alternative story, the key difference between the two is that the non-obsessional story includes direct links to reality, right? And I'm not going to get into this very much because this is what our next module really covers. But this is a hint of how we're working with that client to stay in their senses. What am I actually experiencing in this moment? And, and alternative stories, right? We be, we're careful with these because they can become compulsive. They need to be happening outside of the bubble. Um, and they're not about proving the obsessional doubt wrong, but they are there to, to work to doubt the doubt, right? We just want to start that seed of we're doubting the doubt, right? So in this picture here, we've got a forest. Um, I want to go for a night, a night hike, right? And there's supposed to be a really good night hike around here. But then what if, what if this is really just a ruse for people who want to go out there and terrorize hikers and there's really crazed lunatics in this woods and I don't want, you know, this is very scary. Or I can trust what the guidebooks say and that it's a beautiful night hike that is kind of foggy at night, but it gets lit up by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lightning bugs, right? So that's the reality of how this hike is talked about. So I can stay in that, right? So the key question for an alternative story is what's changed, the target or the story, right? So in, in this, instance, the forest didn't change. It's just, what am I telling myself about the forest? Okay. Okay. So reality sensing do's. When we are uh, reality sensing, we want to stay with information in the here and now. We want to use senses as you do in non-OCD situations and rely on the five senses and their common sense. Because sometimes it's just facts that we know to be true that we are doubting ourselves that we know those to be true. So there's our common sense coming into play. And when we're using our senses as you do in non-OCD situations, um, when Amanda presented a few weeks back, she had some wonderful examples of this where we just work with clients on, well, how do you know that you're sitting here watching this video right now? How do you know um, you're, I'm drinking, how do I know I'm drinking water and not vodka, right? How do I know um, my experience in this moment outside of OCD, I'm totally trusting that I can taste the differences. I can see the differences. I can um, feel and experience those differences. So we want to be able to work with the clients to, to see that their senses work just fine most of the time. And they can use that um, when they are in their obsessional doubt. The reality sensing don'ts. Right? So we do not want to fill in those blanks with assumptions, right? We do not want to overuse our senses and we do not want to put in too much effort. It really does not take a lot of effort for me to see that I have four pins on my desk, right? Very simple. I don't have to stare and make sure that they're all pins, right? And we want to make sure that the clients can understand that it does not take a lot of effort for us to use our sensory inputs. Okay, so the last part of this um, chapter is the exercise that we can use to help clients really start to build that trust and use of their senses. Right. So I'm going to walk through the steps that are in that final exercise, that client worksheet, um, and, and then we can really open this up for discussion. Um, so when an obsession or thought occurs that takes you beyond the senses, hold still and imagine yourself between the worlds. OK, 
right? So this is when we are noticing that crossover point, right? And we're asking clients to focus the attention back on the reality. I know with, with my clients, I'm, I'm teaching, you know, the grounding exercise, the very simple five, four, three, two, one for lots of different reasons. And I think this can be a perfect place um, for clients to be using that grounding exercise. What do I see, smell, feel, hear, taste, right? Um, we wanna realize for a moment that this is all the information you need and that trying to obtain more information from elsewhere means you have already crossed into the bubble. So if I go and I check another time to make sure that I turned off the water and it still doesn't feel like I quite know for sure and I'm, I'm getting some reassurance or I'm, I'm, I'm checking one more time, I'm looking one more time, I've already crossed into the bubble. Right, and I need to be pulling, pulling myself back. Look down from the bridge and notice the, oh gosh, I can't even read, <laughs> I can't read what it says, but notice what you're standing on, right? So it's, it's identifying that I am in this place that feels uncomfortable. And I think, you know, this was absolutely talked about a couple weeks ago where it can feel a bit disconcerting to disengage with that for a customer or for a client, right? Like, it's, I feel irresponsible if I don't follow through. And so there is a certain amount of discomfort that can come along with learning how to trust the senses. So take a moment to realize that the experience that you're having is imaginary and then act on the information from your senses to dismiss the obsession and not engage in any compulsive ritual. So I think, you know, in looking at this, it looks very much like traditional response prevention. Um, and, and it is response prevention. You are preventing the typical response. I think what's really key is that this is coming from a place of understanding that the obsession is false. With each one of the steps as we're progressing through these modules, it's really about the client understands that it's imaginary, that it is irrelevant, that it is against reality. Those concepts are necessary before moving into this sort of behavioral um, intervention. So, you know, it's, it's having the client identify that I don't need to do any sort of a, a reality-based solution to this imaginary problem. And, Teresa quote, I'm pretty sure she's quoting Fred. She said this a, a, a lot of times, but the doing follows the knowing. And that's, that's incredibly important um, factor in, um, in helping clients to disengage at this point of, of the treatment. And again, to quote our, our wonderful colleague, Teresa, and her reality sensing um, story, at the end of the day, it is night. <laughs> and I am going to stop sharing from there. And here I just wanna open it up. I wanna have discussion. I wanna hear from people who have questions and also allow those of you who are much uh, better versed in this to, um, to talk about your favorite um, exercises you use with, with clients for, um, for reality sensing. So thank you. That's great, Carrie. Thank you. I loved all the pictures. I loved the, the visuals. They were just very engaging and, and you know, I felt very grounded in reality. <laughs> I have a question. <clears throat> so this comes back for me when, um, so like when clients have things like, because recently like one of the things that's happening is when, when they have like a real event that's taken place, right? Where they did do something. Um, so part of this module would then say things like, even if something did occur, however long ago it was, um, you know, let's come back to the here and right now and kind of in context um, and look at, you know, is that actually currently an issue? You know, is, is that something you're actually currently doing kind of, is that what we're talking about? 
I guess it would depend on what their doubt is about that situation, but, and please others um, jump in here, but yeah, I think it is a matter of like, but what's happening in this moment? Where did that thought occur? Because if it didn't occur from any context clue in your reality in this moment, then it's just coming from your imagination. It's just coming from your thoughts. Does, does that make sense? Got it. So if there was like a mistake that somebody made that they're still having doubts around or carrying it around and kind of really fixated on that um, and having a lot of in, in different, you know, different triggers, intrusions and so on, it, it's more bringing it into, okay, that was then, but what about here now, right? Like, like that's not, What's is that doubt? Right? Is that relevant now, right? The doubt would be like that, you know, because that happened that like I did something then that I'm, I'm a bad person. Like I'm, I, I continue to like, like I can't make these decisions because you know, what if I won't make the right decision and then it's gonna bring, keeps bringing it back to, you know, I'm, I'm a bad person. Good question. Is anybody else able to kind of jump in here and help me out a little bit? <laughs> so I, I think in that terms, like what, what if I'm a bad person is such a high level doubt. Like, can you pinpoint even further up? Cause I feel like what if I'm a bad person is really the consequence of, of the doubt. So it's quite downstream from the initial um, trigger doubt consequence than anxiety. Um, so I think coming back further, further up the sequence and please anybody else jump in because I don't feel like I'm the expert here, but further up the sequence, what triggered them in that moment to say, to create, to come back to that memory. And that I think is where you have the opportunity to then reground in reality in the moment. Um, and I missed the question too. So if, if you guys want to repeat the question, I'd be happy to try to chime in too. It's, Carrie, it sounds like you're covering um, that you're answering, you know, very well. So I don't know if there's more that was needed. Yeah, no, I feel good. Thank you. <clears throat> I was talking about a real, like real one, real events occur and, and folks, you know, start to, you know, part of the obsessive process, right, is, is going backwards and kind of reviewing that real event and kind of how, like all the possible, of course, you know, um, negative outcomes and really connecting to that definite story and, and that kind of, you know, vulnerable self. And so kind of with using this reality sensing, how to help them come back. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like Carrie covered that she answered that for you. Was there more? Do you feel that it was covered, Christina? Yeah, okay. I also think that maybe the uh, the real self story that we determine that we create later is going to help with that piece of it, where <laughs> reality sensing is really helpful for that acute moment of doubt where we need to turn back to reality because the the idea of saying that was then and this is now is still kind of argumentative with the OCD to me versus saying I know how I got there is through that OCD process I'm actually just putting my focus on now I'm letting go of that versus saying that was old evidence um, so I think that there's multiple things at play there it could also be that the there are real like shame issues that came out of things that have happened in the past where they've made mistakes that we wouldn't want to use like an OCD specific uh, intervention for, we'd be OCD informed in it, but it's it's just shame work of the, that um, is it's not about the doubt anymore. That's my thought. So I want to say something, just see if I'm on the right path, because I had a similar situation with a client who she's afraid to drive and um, she only drives when she absolutely has to, but she's super cautious. 